we've brought out the black turtleneck. It's officially dark academia season. In the recent weeks there has been a chill in the air, the leaves in my garden are turning orange, the smell of burning wood and hot tea is just in the air, it's in my house, I've been having a lot of peppermint tea. It's officially autumn, it's basically what I'm trying to say, that was meant to be like a vibey intro and I just kind of lost my train of thought and started talking nonsense. Um, but in the most recent weeks I've been drinking more tea, it's got a little bit cold, I've been putting on my big woolly jumpers. I watched Carline, therefore autumn is here. <laughs> and as well as all the weather changes, September also brings a new school year for the majority of people. Not me anymore, I am graduated out of school and university, so I have to fill that void. I say that void, I always dreaded school starting, but now that I don't have it anymore, I do miss that sort of sense of structure and like a sort of fresh start a fresh beginning you know I always used to love like buying all my like stationery for the year and like seeing friends like that first few weeks of school was always really nice before like the intensity of the workload got really bad um so like I do have a bit of nostalgia for those first couple weeks of school which are like in September when like the weather's still like not that cold but the leaves are turning just a very lovely like season of anticipation and I just I just love that, it just makes me feel ooh. So like I said, because I'm not actually starting school, I have to fill the void and do it vicariously through books. And the best way to do that is with Dark Academia. And as we all know, Babel by R.F. Kang is like booktube's most talked about Dark Academia novel at the moment. It's just come out. It's like a very hyped author because she wrote the Poppy War series, which I'm still to get to. Um, but I just bought this blind, uh, blind faith that she was an amazing writer and I'm so excited to get to this. But I also have The Maidens by Alex Michael Lides, and that's been sitting on my TBR for a while. Um, and obviously they're both sort of Dark Academia themed. This one is set in Cambridge and this one is set in Oxford. So I thought, oh, that'd be quite fun to like read them side by side because obviously Cambridge and Oxford have like a decades long probably centuries long rivalry at this point and I just thought it would be fun to like read them side by side, chat about them, compare notes and just have a good old spooky time. Babel is a lot chunkier and it's the one that I think I'll enjoy the most. I think I'm going to save that as my second read of this vlog and then The Maidens is much shorter and I think I can maybe read that a little bit quicker. It's kind of like um, stretching before a marathon, you know? Like in Friends, when Joey has to eat an entire turkey by himself and then Monica's like telling him off for having crisps before because she's like, you have to save room for the big turkey that you're gonna eat. And he's like, you wouldn't do a marathon without stretching. Like, this is like stretching the stomach before I like embark on the big turkey. That's, that's what this is. <laughs> have my Najis always been this shit or is it just like, the autumn fever has got to my brain. I don't know. But yes, this is my packet of crisps before Babel Big Turkey. I hope that made some sort of sense and I am very excited to get to both of these books and discuss them with you. Spring is the season that wakes me alive And fall is the season to contemplate life Oh, yeah. I don't know What is it exactly in this time of year That makes the melancholy me reappear Oh, yeah. Back and forth Through dark roast coffee Salt mist and sea Sand and Say goodbye. 
Hello, I just got caught in the biggest storm I've ever been in, in my life. Um, on my way back from the cinema with my dad, we both got drenched, so as soon as we came home, we've turned on the heating, changed into cosy pyjamas, and are like, shivering. So I thought, I'm feeling cosy, it's cold and grey and horrible outside. Perfect time to update my Dark Academia reading vlog. Which I remember I said at the start, I was like, oh, it's gonna be like <laughs> reading these two books and comparing them. Fuck that. I'm just gonna gush about Babel. Um, I did read the other one. Uh, <laughs> the other one. The Maidens by Alex Michaelides. I did read, I read it in the course of about a day. Very like compelling, obviously. I finished it quickly. And I always feel like with books that I read quickly, I can never be too harsh on them because of course they're written in a very compelling way way clearly there was something about the story that kept me interested, that kept me glued, but just ultimately there is nothing about this book that would make me want to come back to it at any point or like push it onto a friend to be like oh my god you have to read this, which sounds harsh. <laughs> but essentially we're following this character Mariana and a year before we pick up with her story her boyfriend sadly passed away so she's obviously still in the throes of grief and she's also a psychotherapist so obviously she's very familiar with dealing with these like heavy emotions and at the beginning of the novel there is a murder that takes place on Cambridge University campus and it's the murder of Mariana's niece's best friend and Mariana's niece is a little bit emotionally unstable, has gone through some stuff in her life, she lost both of her parents, so there's a, there's a lot of grieving people basically. So Mariana goes through to Cambridge to be the emotional support for her niece and while she's there she's like, why not treat myself to a little bit of investigation? Why not? I'm here anyway. As a treat, let's just try and like catch the killer. For shits and giggles. And there's this professor at the college who's like a little bit skeevy and he has this little society, this little study group called the Maidens which are like all young attractive women who are kind of obsessed with him and it's all a bit culty and so Mariana starts to investigate and obviously it's a little bit weird. And throughout I did like the literary references, for example even Mariana's name is literary reference, there's a lot of references throughout to Tennyson, and there is a Tennyson poem called Mariana about this woman, Mariana, who just stands at a window waiting for her lover to return to her. Um, and it's all about sort of grief and melancholia. I remember writing like melancholia in like bright red pen and like highlighting it in school because I was not a good student. <laughs> and I guess that's the only element of this book that really feels like dark academia, like obviously it's set at Cambridge University and there's a murder, so then you've got, you know, the academia and you've got the dark, you know, the murder. But it almost just felt like a backdrop, like it kind of felt like a police procedural that just happened to take place at Cambridge University. There was nothing about the university itself that was kind of a driving force of this book, because obviously she suspects this tutor. There's a little bit about how he inspires a sort of cult-like following and I think that was an interesting thread about how we tend to blindly believe educators because they are obviously coming from this place of like privilege and knowledge and we just tend to have blind trust in these figures but that is kind of undermined by the ending because that just never comes to anything um it is a little bit of like a red herring which i don't know if that's a spoiler but it's been out for a while so uh. but yeah the ending was a surprise to me just because i think it kind of comes out of nowhere and i think that's where this falls down slightly for me like i did enjoy the experience of reading it like i said i finished it very quickly i was compelled but now that i know the ending i just don't feel the need to like talk about it anymore and i want to talk about babel so thank you alex it was fun but let's talk about Babel, the masterpiece. Oh my god. Now if you know anything about me, which you might if you've been here for a while, I overshare on this channel way too much. I was that kid who was like very obsessed with Hermione Granger. I know that's not a popular thing to say anymore, um, but you know, I was a child, I didn't know any better. We did not yet know the depths of JK Rowling's personality, I guess. I very much identified with Hermione Granger. I was a very big reader as a kid. I had very big curly messy hair as a kid. I was like, that's gonna be me. So then when I started my high school journey, I always pictured myself applying to Oxford, applying to Cambridge, and I wanted to study English and I wanted to write. And every time I watched Harry Potter and like saw all that beautiful architecture, you know, it's actually filmed in parts of Magdalen College. Like, 
it just it all just started to coalesce and I was like this this is what I'm destined for you know turns out no I find academia very bloody stressful I really really crumbled under the weight of exams in high school and A levels and it just turned out wasn't for me so I went to art school which was not rigorous at all and I got a first class degree which is great I had a good time but there is that tiny part of my heart that just wishes I was cut out for that life, you know? That like all night studying in the library, like being buried under the weight of all these ancient dusty books, you know, walking on this campus where so many clever and iconic and influential figures of history have walked before you. There's just like a certain romance to that lifestyle, which is an illusion. And you can understand that on an intellectual level, but that part of your heart still wishes that you're a part of that like elite inner circle, even if you recognize that the fact that knowledge is being held in an elite inner circle is inherently wrong. And so that's why the genre of dark academia obviously appeals to me. I want to have a seat at that table. I want a peek into that world without having to like be academically brilliant and put myself through the pain of like being in that world. And that's why when I first heard about Babel, I was instantly like gagging to read it because it's essentially a book that deconstructs the romanticization of dark academia and obviously if you love dark academia that sounds a bit scary because you don't want someone to come and like shit all over the genre that you love but it does it in a way that is just so clever and so heartbreaking because the characters in this novel they also love that lifestyle and that's part of the inner conflict of it. So at the beginning we meet this young boy in Canton and his mother is dying and he thinks he's about to die too of this sickness and this man suddenly appears and cures him and whisks him off on this ship to England and this man tells him that he's going to study Latin and Greek and when he's of age he's going to go to Babel, which is this famous institute of translation based in Cambridge at Cambridge University. And this young boy from Canton picks a new name for himself and he goes with Robin Swift, Swift from, um, you know, Jonathan Swift who wrote Gulliver's Travels, I believe, and he begins to study in England and he's living in a sort of life of luxury, you know, he lives in this big house with this professor and all of his wants are taken care of, he never goes hungry, he's learning all these amazing languages and he gets the kind of travel via the page, all of these opportunities that, you know, wouldn't have been open to him had he stayed in like that little slum that he was in in Canton. And this plants the seed of this conflict that basically defines Robin's life. You know, he's so resentful of the fact that the empire and England has torn him away from his home, his home language, the fact that his language is being co-opted by the empire, I'll get onto that in a bit, um, but also the fact that he has to be grateful um, for this because otherwise he wouldn't be alive, otherwise he wouldn't be enjoying all of these fine things. And so when he finally becomes of age he arrives at Babel, this beautiful beautiful place, and he finds out about the magic of the Translation Institute. And essentially the Translation Institute takes silver, like the, the metal silver, and through the power of translation makes magic. So they have these silver bars where uh, for example, you put one word in one language on one end and then you write another word in a different language, like a translated word, on the other end and through like nuance and different meanings, like the little bits that get lost in translation, the little ephemeral things that you can't quite put your finger on, that's what gives the bar its power. And these silver bars, like they make transport go faster, they make plumbing work better, and so essentially these different languages are being co-opted by this rich institution to like make their society better. And the reason that Robin was picked was because he knows Chinese, which is obviously quite a rare language. And in his year, there are other students that have also been plucked from other places of the world that have been brought to study. For example, his best friend, his closest friend, Rami, was uh, brought from Calcutta. Um, in India and was raised learning Greek and Latin and now has been brought to Babel knowing Sanskrit so that he can again use these ancient foreign languages to power the empire, to power England and industry. And obviously Robin's not stupid, he realises that like this isn't really something that he wants to be a part of. So then it's very tempting when Robin has a chance encounter in the middle of the night with somebody called Griffin. Griffin who is in the middle of doing something very, very illegal. And Griffin opens him up to this underground society whose essential main goal is to tear down Babel, to tear down uh, the theft of foreign languages for the benefit of the empire. It's a very tempting idea and thus 
begins the unravelling of the story, essentially. And it is just so incredibly well written and you really just feel the pain in Robin's heart. Like, I totally understand why he hates everything around him, why he has such resentment for being brought in but also not fully brought in because obviously he's Asian and he doesn't look like all of the other students in Oxford. He gets mocked and he gets ridiculed and so on the one hand he has to be grateful because he's alive and he gets to, you know, learn all of these wonderful languages and he gets to be part of this small elite society and he gets to like drink fancy wine and he gets this fancy stipend where he can buy these clothes and buy these books and have this cushy academic post once he's finished with his training. But he's never going to be fully recognized, he's never going to be fully rewarded for his talent, he's never going to be as good as his white counterparts. And he sees this problem even worse with Rami, who is a dark-skinned man, and with Victoire, who is a dark-skinned woman from Haiti. He realizes that he has this privilege of, you know, sometimes passing as white, but he hates that. He hates that he has to sort of play along with a society that clearly doesn't want him and doesn't want his friends. And obviously that's about race, but it's also about gender. For example, Victoire and Letty, who are also students at Babel, they can't go into the library and check out certain books without, like, a man's approval. So all of them are very grateful because they're being afforded these opportunities, these opportunities to earn money and advance in society and do something, you know, worthwhile and, you know, make a difference in the world. But also none of them are equal, they're not treated equally. And that conflict is so palpable because on the one hand it's shut up, stay quiet, enjoy the privilege that you're being spoon-fed, that's being drip-fed to you by, you know, somebody else that you're not in control of at all, or say, fuck it, this is awful and I don't want to contribute to this anymore. And that's essentially like the crux of the novel and it's just so well written and it's just so wonderful and you spend years with these characters like the book covers a span of I'd say I'd think about five years while they're studying while they're at college and it really really paints that picture of the beginning like the honeymoon phase when they're all falling in love with the college and all of the wonderful things it can give them and you know finding these friends that finally understand you for example when Robin meets Rami and Victoire and Letty it's the first time in his life where he's met people that have had that same experience of him as being you know picked up from somewhere else and being treated as lesser and not quite fitting in having one foot in each world and that bonds them so quickly. He doesn't want to betray Babel, he doesn't want to let go of this world because it's the first time that he's felt truly seen and truly needed, but then the cost of that is just awful. And the sort of, it's not a tagline, but like the sort of bit at the start of the blurb in Babel says, an act of translation is always an act of betrayal. And I just think that's such an interesting idea of that like, translation as as a tool is obviously wonderful it's how we understand each other it's how we learn about different communities it's how we connect the world it's such a vital thing but also it's so easy for things to get lost and it's so easy for things to be twisted and for example the book has footnotes throughout it and i thought that was just like a a reference to like academia because obviously you know most books that have footnotes and extra information are academic books so I thought oh that's quite clever like they're all kind of studying and then we get the footnotes that makes sense and um, but there's actually like a much more interesting explanation for why there is footnotes um, and I've written it down because I prepared for this. You can tell that I really like the book because I've actually written down things that I want to quote to you. That's that. I was paying attention when I was reading so that you could tell it's a good one. So in this section I think they were talking about um, different translation centres and different texts and the footnote says, other products included among others a comparative analysis of the quantity of footnotes added to translations of European texts versus non-European texts. Non-European texts, Griffin found, tended to be loaded down with an astonishing amount of explanatory context to the effect that the text was never read as a work on its own but always through the guided lens of the white European translator. So I guess in the early days of translation when you would fa find these kind of ancient foreign texts, when they would be translated they would have all these footnotes that were written with a white audience in mind. So in a way it is an act of betrayal because, you know, the original text is not written with that audience in mind and there are certain words that will be over translated or mistranslated so that the audience in mind will better understand what that is because sometimes there isn't like a word to word equivalent for something. So it warps the meaning of the text itself so it fits in better with like a white audience and that is horrendous. <laughs> so not only is this an incredible 
dark academia novel that is set in a beautiful institution that is so so inherently flawed and this book perfectly deconstructs and illustrates all of those flaws. It's also just a wonderful portrayal of friendship and lost people coming together and the pain of realising that the way that they've come together is not sustainable and that there are cracks between them and there will always be resentments between them and that is always going to implode and it is just it's just so good and it's so clever and it goes into a lot more detail about all of the silver stuff that I was trying to uh, explain with my like rudimentary vocabulary um, explains it much much better in the novel so if you're interested you know even if you're not interested I really recommend that you you read it because like the magic system is just so interesting and obviously RF Kang has done so much work in looking into you know different you know etymology of different words and like how things have been translated and mistranslated which is the key thing over the years and it is just such a layered and detailed work of art and it was so interesting reading this actually during all of the protests that were happening you probably saw that protest that went viral of the soup on the van gogh painting but it wasn't even on the painting it was on the glass because at the beginning of each chapter of babel it starts with a quote from like a famous text and at the beginning of chapter 26, it says, Colonialism is not a machine capable of thinking, a body endowed with reason. It is naked violence and only gives in when confronted with greater violence, which is by Franz Fanon from The Wretched of the Earth, translated by Richard Philcox. And so obviously that quote is very relevant because Robin and his friends are really grappling with the idea of whether they can stand up to such a massive institution as Babel and whether they even should or want to, what do they stand to gain from trying to cripple colonialism and the empire, is it even possible? And reading that in the context of everyone being very, very outraged at the throwing the soup onto the painting, which is not even damaged, it was just really, really interesting about how do we stand up to these systems that we feel powerless against and why it's so important to believe that we're not powerless. And it was just very, very moving and really gave me some food for thought and it was just incredible and all these problems are so interlinked like it talks obviously mainly about colon colonialism and you know co-opting other you know languages and people and you know it's, a lot of it is about the slave trade as well but also that's not isolated from capitalism and sexism and you know racism all of these issues are so intermixed and obviously now we still have all of those problems but also add the ticking clock of climate change like there are so many things that are stacked against us that we feel powerless to change and this book I think stands to remind us that we're not powerless and it does it in a really beautifully and devastatingly written way and oh god I just recommend it, I just recommend it so much. And I also want to iterate that as much as it's devastating and clever and intellectual and so densely packed with information it's also just so readable and the characters are so like beautifully drawn that it's a joy to read. Like it's not, I wouldn't call it a happy book, but it's a joy to read in the sense that you're in the hands of somebody who knows exactly what they're doing and can just write well. And it is just, like I said, a joy to sink into every time you open the book. It is wonderful. And with that, I'm going to leave you with um, a quote from the time that um, Robin first meets the other students in his year at Babel, Rami, Victoria, and Letty, and they've just had their sort of first meeting, their first lunch together, and um, it's it's just it's just beautiful. It's a lovely moment, and I'm going to leave you with that. If I haven't already convinced you to read the book, this will, I hope. By the time they finished their tea, they were almost in love with each other. Not quite yet, because true love took time and memories, but as close to love as first impressions could take them. The days had not yet come when Rami wore Victoria's sloppily knitted scarves with pride, when Robin learned exactly how long Rami liked his tea steeped so he could have it ready when he inevitably came to the buttery late from his Arabic tutorial, or when they all knew Letty was about to come to class with a paper bag full of lemon biscuits because it was a Wednesday morning and Taylor's Bakery put out lemon biscuits on Wednesdays. But that afternoon they could see with certainty the kind of friends they would be, and loving that vision was close enough. Later, when everything went sideways and the world broke in half, Robin would think back to this day, to this hour, at this table, and wonder why they had been so quick, so carelessly eager to trust one another. Why had they refused to see the myriad of ways they could hurt each other? Why had they not paused to interrogate their differences in birth, in raising, that meant they were not and could never be on the same side? But the answer was obvious, that they were all four of them drowning in the unfamiliar, and they saw in each other a raft, and clinging to one another was the only way to stay afloat. Ooh. <laughs> 
I had earmarked that quote uh, before I reached the end of the novel and reading that back, knowing what happens, oh the heart breaks, the heart doth break. So yeah this reading vlog has evolved quite a bit, it started out as, as an experiment of reading two books and essentially it's just me gushing about Babel. Um, that's what the video is now and I hope you enjoy it. If you've read it, please talk to me about it because I'm obsessed if that wasn't obvious already and if you haven't read it get on that because it's brilliant. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you very soon with another video soon. Bye!